please welcome President and CEO of Geisinger, Dr. David Feinberg. Is it getting older? I'm really excited to talk about Geisinger, but can we just play that music again one more time? No, seriously. So that's, that, that song's called Gravity. It's by Cherry Beach. My son's a songwriter. I got my last kid off the payroll. It came out last week. So, so, all right, all right. So, um, Download it on iTunes, but he said, Dad, people don't do that anymore. They would get it on Spotify or something like that. But Gravity by Cherry Beach. So um, excited to be here. Uh, I've been listening to the talks, and I keep saying as the people walk off stage, you just gave my talk. So I'll try to be fresh, uh, but there were questions out here of when will whole exome sequencing become clinical and offered to everyone. So we're announcing that here today. So at uh, Geisinger, uh, starting now, uh, we are going to say to patients when they come in to see us, you need your colonoscopy, you haven't had your mammography, let's get a blood check, and let's do your whole exome sequencing. So pretty early on, we went big into genomics. We have about 200,000 patients now that we've consented uh, through a research study with Regeneron. They've been an amazing partner where through de-identified data. Regeneron has come up with incredible drug discoveries based on the Geisinger patients. But we felt that the research was going too slow in crossing the chasm and getting it into clinical care. So examples, uh, I met this 16-year-old girl a few months ago. She had come into our hospital. She was dehydrated from soccer practice. And uh, like all the nice people that we care for, we asked her to be in our study. And she said, sure. And we did her whole exome sequencing, and we found two genes associated with uh, fatal cardiac arrhythmias in young athletes, when you hear about the young kid dying at football practice. So she has both of the genes. Uh, where we are in central Pennsylvania, a lot of people don't move, so we have multiple families. In some ways, we call ourselves the Iceland of America. And uh, we looked at the 30 people that we were treating in her family, and 15 of them had that genetic defect and we'll call her Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill died in a restaurant two years ago and the cause of death was choking. But on retrospect, he didn't choke, he had a fatal cardiac arrhythmia. And now, 15 out of those 30 people that have the gene are getting appropriate treatment, including the young lady who now has a defibrillator and a beta blocker and won't die from a fatal cardiac arrhythmia because of her genetics. And so when we found those kinds of stories, in our research subjects, we said it's now time to move it into straight clinical care. So at no cost to our patients, every Geisinger patient will be offered whole exome sequencing for medically actionable conditions that we can do something about. So the way that it works is you'd come in, the doc would say to you, hey, we haven't checked your cholesterol, let's do your genome, literally in that same kind of thinking as far as preventive care. If a medically actionable condition comes back, uh, a genetic mutation, that doctor gets an email and it's connected to a 30-minute CME course so the doctor can brush up on BRCA or familiar hypercholesterolemia or Lynch syndrome or malignant hyperthermia. Five days later, the patient is notified, you have a genetic mutation and we want you to speak with your doctor. They come in and meet and then decide on a course of action, whether that's being sent to our breast center, whether referred to genetic counseling, and as we've rolled this program out, we've seen about three and a half, and we think it'll be pretty soon, 15% of patients will have one of these genetic mutations that requires this type of intervention. And so we've hired as many genetic counselors as we can, but it's not been enough. Uh, so we've developed in partnership a chat bot that allows genetic counseling to take place on a mobile platform. And in our trials, 90% of our patients get through genetic counseling without ever speaking to a geneticist. So we call her Gia, she's kind of cute, she's the avatar on your phone, she says you may know my 
cousin Siri, and then she kind of rolls her eyes, and then she enters into, you got Braca, here's what it is, when can we talk, when can we talk to your sister, have you told your mom, what about your daughters, etc. So that we're really, really excited about. Um, but the title of my talk is What Really Matters? And we think that that genetic piece is just a sliver of what really matters. And what we talk about too much in healthcare, I think, is how great we are as doctors and hospitals and nurses and taking care of patients. Access to great health care probably has 20% effect on whether you're going to live or die or how many years in your life you're going to have or life in your years. The other 80% that we spend so little time talking about is what really matters. And that 80% certainly is your genetic code. And we're all in on it. So we think as others are talking about doing research and trying to get a million people, we're moving, continuing our research, but moving from our research into just clinical care for genetic. But as important as your genetic code is, so is your zip code. And as we sequence DNA, we keep saying we have to sequence zip codes or sequence ZNA. And what happens in zip codes? So we've seen where we are in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, that lots of folks that have food insecurity have type 2 diabetes. And those disorders really go together. If you have food insecurity, meaning you answer yes to one of two questions, I don't have money for food, I'm worried about food this month. And that's not just in a Medicaid population. We're seeing that about 20 to 30 percent of our commercially insured patients still have issues about food. When you're food insecure, what you do is buy high caloric cheap food that causes type 2 diabetes. If you have type 2 diabetes, you have a two to three chance greater of being food insecure because type 2 diabetes means you're sick all the time, you miss work, you lose your work, and you don't have a lot of money. So bi-directionally, we think that this is a big problem. I'm 56 years old. When I was born, less than 1% of the United States had type 2 diabetes. Today it is 10%, and if I live a full lifetime into my 80s or 90s, it's predicted that 30% of the United States will have type 2 diabetes, and it's probably another 20% that'll be pre-diabetics. This is a food-borne illness, and the treatment for malnutrition is food, and the treatment for type 2 diabetes is food. So we took our food-insecure patients, and we said to them, well, what if you come in, we'll do some diabetic education, and remember, these folks are getting good care. Geisinger's a great health system. They're seeing great doctors. Everyone's board certified. We've got care managers. We have dietitians. These are our patients. They're getting care. And their hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of your blood sugar over the last three, six months, should be six and a half or seven percent, is 11, 13, 8. It's two or three points higher than it should be. People that have access to care have blood sugars that are out of control. And we've been telling them, you just need to do diet and exercise. But if you can't get the food, you can't get the disorder in control. So we brought them in. We started with six patients. And we said, OK, let's give you fresh, healthy food for you and your family every week. And we started literally with a little market. And uh, next year, we will be serving one and a half million meals. And what have we found when we gave food insecure patients and their families six, I'm sorry, seven vegetables, seven fruits, lean meats, and uh, whole grains and legumes every week, hemoglobin A1Cs went from 13 down to 7. On average, we had a 2.5 point decrease in hemoglobin A1C. To get an FDA medicine approved for type 2 diabetes, you have to show hemoglobin A1C drops one point. So metformin may decrease you one point, but carrots and quinoa decreases at 2.5 points. And it actually means that the other people at home won't get type 2 diabetes because we're giving our metformin to the whole family. So the side effects, if this were a medication, would be your sex life gets better, you won't have any amputations, you won't go blind, you won't have kidney disease, and your, the rest of your family will be healthy. So please don't take it if you're allergic to any of those things. So, so to us, that, that's what really matters. And as an integrated delivery system, when we talk about sustainability, whether it's with our sequencing DNA or giving folks a million and a half meals a year, the question is, is it sustainable? 
Well, those first six patients that we looked at typically were costing us about $200,000 a year in healthcare costs. They'd come in for amputations, multiple hospitalizations. They were pretty sick. They had hemoglobin A1Cs of 11, 12, and 13. Within three months in the program, their healthcare costs decreased to about $40,000 a year, and the food cost us $1,200. So we go from $200,000 down to $40,000, and there is clear literature that every decrease in hemoglobin A1C saves the healthcare system $8,000, just a one-point decrease. So for us, it makes sense, and now we're scaling it to f folks who are not food insecure, and we'll have to see how that works. We're scaling it to pediatric obesity, we're scaling to digestive heart failure, we're literally opening up fresh food pharmacies at every one of our regional campuses and turning our pharmacy into places that look like Whole Foods. But in addition to, thank you. I, I really wish you clapped for the song in the beginning, but that's, um, in addition to food, there's a lot more that's going on in these environments. So we actually will be providing docs at Geisinger with something that we call a Lyme score. And a Lyme score, we look at where our patients live and based on how close they are to the forest and the rates of Lyme's disease in that microenvironment, they will get a score between one and nine so when they come in to see the doc, not only does the doctor see their whole exome, not only have we screened everyone for food insecurity, but they get a Lyme score. They also get a score about their rate of having, their risk of having methicillin resistant Staph aureus or MRSA based on how close they live to high velocity livestock areas. So we have lots of livestock and they're slaughtering them and they're using a lot of antibiotics and those antibiotics, based on how close you are to the actual area, increases your chances of MRSA. And they get a score on respiratory illness based on how close you live to Marcellus Shale in the areas of northern Pennsylvania where that's happening. So all of the information comes forward to the doc in advance so those patients can have a better idea of what's going on. But that's not helpful if you can't get to the doc. So we've seen transportation as a serious issue. Uh, Geisinger is spread in, I think it was James Carville went through Pennsylvania once with one of the Clintons on a campaign, and after traveling across Pennsylvania, he said, oh, I get it, it's Philadelphia at one end and Pittsburgh in the other and Alabama in the middle. We're, we're in Alabama, or maybe he said Kentucky, but we're, that's who we are. And they're in rural America, transportation is a huge issue. So instead of worrying about it anymore, we said if you live within 50 miles of our catchment area, in central Pennsylvania, or 25 miles in our area in northeast, which is Scranton and Wilkes-Barre, and you need a ride to anywhere for any reason, we got you covered. So we offer free transportation to anyone in, of our members, it's about 600,000 patients that we care for in our health plan, if they need a ride to the doctor, to church, to the supermarket, or to see their friend. Because we know that loneliness and isolation has the same kind of negative health consequences as obesity and uh, substance abuse. So we're gonna eliminate that by making sure that folks have the ability to get to where they're going. Then the other thing, I was uh, rounding and I talked to one of our care managers and I said, if you could have anything, um, what would you like? And she said, I have this pregnant opiate dependent mom and I can't get her housing. And we stopped, we literally stopped the train then, and said, well, let's look in our whole system, how many opiate dependent moms do we have that we know about that are homeless? And on that particular day, and I think we probably only identified 10%, we came up with 17 of them. And we said, this is crazy. These are our people that we're caring for. We certainly know if you're homeless and you're opiate addicted, that you're gonna have a very, very high chance of having a baby who ends up in the NICU. You're certainly gonna have a baby or a young child that has high rates or high risk for adverse childhood events like sexual abuse or physical abuse. So we said, we gotta stop it. So what we're launching, and we're calling it Project Home, although we don't know we're gonna keep that name, is we've identified all of the pregnant moms 
in our system who are opiate dependent, and we are literally moving into their house. So if they're homeless, we get them a house. If they're in housing that's unsafe, we get them new housing, and we literally bring all the treatment they need into the home so that they don't relapse, so that when the baby's born, the baby's not taken away from them, so that they have all the parenting skills necessary to take care of their child after delivery. We're using this vulnerable moment to capture them, put our arms around them, and say, we got you covered, and we're going to help you and your new baby when your baby comes out. The, um, we don't know what the results will be. But 14 people a day are dying in Pennsylvania from opiate overdose. The opiate dose rate in the town that I live in, opiate death rate, the, the death rate from opiates, is four times higher than in New York City. And so for us, as a health system that's ultimately engaged in our community, uh, we think it's important to really listen to what's happening and make sure that we take care of our friends and neighbors that we think is such a privilege to care for. So to us, what really matters is so much of what's happening outside of the clinic and outside of the hospital. I get in trouble because I say this often, but I actually believe it. Uh, in our system, we have uh, 13 hospitals. At least that's what they tell me. And um, I think my job is to close all of them. I know out of 2,000 beds that we have, if people ate right, used alcohol in moderation, and moderation means one small drink for all you women out there and two small drinks for all you men, didn't use illegal drugs, wear their seatbelts, don't shoot one another, get their genome done, have transportation, have access to broccoli and blueberries. If we did those kinds of things, those 2,000 patients that I and my team are responsible for tonight in the Geisinger Hospital, 1,000 of them would not be there. We could literally solve our healthcare crisis in America by doing those few things. Seven out of 10 Americans, seven out of 10 Americans are on a prescription medication. So we can have a lot of breakout rooms here and conferences about what are we gonna do about pharma pricing? Or we can get a lot of people off medication. And we're really talking about, in a lot of ways, to me, proven social and behavioral techniques to get us healthy again. This has happened in my lifetime. And uh, I think what we want to do uh, before we're gone is to reverse the course so that our kids actually got a much better shot at it than we do. For the first time in our life, the life expectancy of Americans has gone down. And to me, that's actually criminal. So we're all into it. It's really exciting to be part of this conference. I think it has a great feel and vibe. And I appreciate you spending some time with me. Thank you very much.